There's no two vertebrae alike in that spine. They all have its own characteristics. And every subluxation has its own characteristics. You can feel the difference between a compensatory adaptation to a subluxation comparing it with a subluxation. And these subluxations, when they are existing, they're the ones that causes nerve pressure and is shutting off nerve supply. Now, with our x-ray work, we'll, we use what we call a parallel. We use this parallel to compare the right side of the body with the left side of the body. Our body is in two halves, the brain as well as the muscular skeleton part of the body. We have developed what we call the Gunstead spinal parallel. This compares the right side of the body with the left side of the body. It shows you a disc level. It has two rollers on each side and it'll roll up, it'll roll up right straight. It'll give us the, the disc level and it'll wind up to our compensation. But we must start from the femur head levels. Then we want to measure up your sacrum level, if that's level. Then you want to measure up your fifth lumbar level. But we compare the right side of the body with the left side. No part of the body will go, uh, will go you know, you know uh, in one unit. The right side will not go in unity with the left side. The one side of the body will go, go anterior, the other side will go posterior. Just like the pelvic mechanics, for instance. You've often heard them talk about a sacrum going anterior, uh, or you'll call, talk about a sacrum and the sacroiliac going posterior. It, it, a sacrum cannot go anterior between the, the nominate bones. It's, it's fit in there, but it cannot go straight anterior, it cannot go posterior between the nominates. But what does happen, then the one nominate will go posterior, and then the other one has to go anterior. One nominate can go EX, the other one must go IN. And when we say EX, we, that's our way of listing the nominate position. We take the superior iliac spine as our listing point. That's the center point, and we compare that with the first tubercle of the sacrum. And when that ilium goes EX, we mean that that ilium goes external or away from the first tubercle of the sacrum. And when it goes away from the first tubercle of the sacrum, it narrows, it gets narrow, it gets small. And now if it goes internal towards the tubercle of the sacrum, the, 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 the nominate gets large. So whenever you have a, a nominate going posterior on the right, the left one has to go anterior. If it goes EX on the right, it's got to go IN on the left. If it goes inferior on the right, it has to go superior on the left. It always has to synchronize with the other. We have to have a compensation. It has to be composite. If this year goes posterior on the right, it's got to go anterior on the left. If it goes e EX on the right, it's got to go IN on the left. And then you can have these combination of positions. Now when the ilium goes posterior on the right, it'll lower your femur head level. It'll drop the sacrum. It makes your legs short on that side. If you lay your patient prone, it shortens that physiologically. If it goes eye in, it'll shorten it a little more. In EX, it'll make it still shorter. And if you have a severe PIEX ilium, going uh, PIEX, it'll shorten that leg as far as, as much as a half inch physiologically. Frequently, three-eighths of an inch. But oftentimes, we'll have that shortened 12, 13 millimeters by just a physiological subluxation of the ilium. That shortens your leg, drops your femur head level, and gives you scoliosis on the right side. And we find in the, uh, oh, like in Meniere syndrome, for instance, uh, hay fever, asthma, all of these so-called cases that we've been looking for up in the upper cervical, migraine headache, for instance. Now, most of our migraine headaches are not a direct nerve pressure headache. That's a glandular deficiency headache. It affects our chemistry. And we find in our practice 
than an ilium, sacrum, or fifth lumbar is our responsible interference due to the endocrine system affecting the body chemistry and bringing on these weekly or, or bi-monthly migraine headaches. We are trying to correct these migraines by upper cervical, but it's not a, a, not a direct nerve pressure. We have uh, nerve tension headaches connected with the upper cervical. But when it comes to a chemical change in our bodies, like a migraine, we do find that in the lower lumbar in our pelvic mechanics. Also our Meniere's disease, that's another thing. I've had cases with Meniere's condition, so adjustment of the sacrum or the ilium, they'll be corrected before they get off the table. I've also had asthma cases. They can't hardly breathe on the table, you just one ilium takes care of their asthmatic conditions. In the past, we've been trying to, trying to uh, locate these particular pressures, like the Merrick system, for instance. Now, a lot of people like to connect the Merrick system with the Gunstead disc concept, but there's no comparison. Now, the Merrick system, as you know, like Dr. Firth's symptomatology, it's more like a prescription uh, type of system. For appendicitis, you'd look for the second lumbar. For asthma, you look for the first dorsal. For ascites, you look for the first dorsal. And we try to prescribe a certain vertebra to a certain symptom. But that, we know, we cannot do that particular thing. Our nervous system is too complex. What we'd have to do is to examine every, every vertebra, very careful, atlas to the tips, to the coccyx, condyle to the, to the coccyx and examine every vertebra very careful because every vertebra is just as important as the other one. One is just as important as the other one. And then when we find these particular subluxations that we, we will find, then we've got to be big enough to accept it. Even though we have an asthmatic condition, we'll probably find a sacrum or an ilium. It's pretty hard for us to accept that as a direct cause for asthma. But nevertheless, we just just that one vertebra only, that one articulation, for instance, just the ilium, sacrum, or the fifth lumbar, and see the miraculous results just from that one adjustment. And that's all we do up there at our clinic. When we run into a case like that, we'll, we'll take the major symptom and, and try to correct that first, and then the others can come follow later on. But the, this idea of trying to prescribe a vertebra or a certain adjustment to a certain symptom, that we, that's, that's past. We, we got by it through the years. We would hit these places. We, we hit them every so often, and, and we got enough people well to, to stay in business. Some of our old-time chiropractors that practice the, the Merrick system, they were pretty fortunate around the fifth lumbar, in the lumbar area, and we got a lot of lumbago cases well back in those days, and they're still doing it. But the scientificness of it is not there. Today we have that scientifically. We can find these particular vertebra. We can prove them in many ways that we have that subluxation through x-rays, through palpation, instrumentation, and then the best part of it, after we have it corrected, we know through the palpation, instrumentation, whether we have it corrected. And then again, it's pretty near as hard after we found that vertebra and corrected it is to leave it alone. It's the biggest and the hardest job for us chiropractors after we have the condition corrected to leave it alone. After vertebra has been corrected, there's nothing more to do. We must leave it alone. And if we don't leave it alone, we're going to disturb probably not that particular vertebra, but something else in your case is going to develop a new symptom. People can get sick from an abnormal or maladjustment as well as getting well. And too many of us chiropractors are too anxious to get our patients well. We don't stop after they are well, and we just and disturb too many places in trying to get them well. The average uh, patient only has two or three real subluxations in that spine. And the rest of these bad looking displacements are, comp are compensatory adaptations to a subluxation. 
Now we'll uh, analyze the full spine and we'll find probably from our parallel probably five disc involvements. And out of these five, we'll find probably two or three of these disc involvements that really have nerve pressure. Now the others, without instrumentation, without uh, palpation, you have no way of knowing whether they really are producing nerve pressure. So instrumentation and palpation is very vital after you read these x-rays and see whether they really have to be adjusted. Many times the, we have a, a subluxation, not a subluxation, but a, a misplacement of a vertebra. It has started to cause a degeneration of that disc. It has caused ballooning or swelling of the disc, but still not as yet producing nerve pressure. And we have left these cases go for several months, check and prayer, four or five months. It's taken as long as two years for a disc to break down and really give nerve pressure. Well, I've watched them for two years before it really caused the nerve involvement. But that disc involvement was there. We picked it up. It was not causing any nerve pressure. I didn't want to disturb it to just see how long it would take to uh, really cause nerve pressure. And I had another an automobile accident case that was a real bad balloon disc. And here's another thing, if I don't, I want to bring it out right now so I don't forget it. In these whiplash cases, when you get these acute cases in whiplash, the disc becomes enlarged. So many times you have looked at a lateral x-ray and you see these large discs. And you say, gee, that's a healthy one. It's not a healthy, that's a sick disc. And whenever it's acute condition, nature puts in fluid to protect the inflammation. So the disc itself uh, balloons up. It swells up twice the size in an acute whiplash case. And uh, when you see these, that's how we pick up our acute whiplash interferences. There's a very acute inflammation on that disc causing nerve pressure. Of course, from a humanitarian standpoint, they just call that just muscle strain of the trapezius and some of the cervical muscles. But whenever you find these thick discs, that's your subluxation, and that's the one that needs immediate attention at that, that particular time. And oftentimes, it'll take three, four days after an a, a, a acute or, or, or an accident before that'll puff up. So when you take an x-ray like a, uh, the next day after an accident, you don't find anything that's really outstanding. You wait three, four days, and you pick up these puffed up fat discs so, somewhere in that cervical region or, any, or anywhere in the spine. We've had lumbar discs, the fifth lumbar, puff up twice the size. And then about, uh, oh, three, four weeks, they start uh, undergoing degeneration, and then they start thinning down and thinning down until you'll have a probably 35% uh, of that disc left. Now, a lot of these thin discs that you see on your fifth lumbar is caused from a subluxation of the fifth lumbar, which has not had a tension and has gone from the ballooning type, thickened type disc into the degenerative type. However, these de degenerative discs, as you run into, even though we only have 30% of that disc, it's still corrective. We still contract those set in that fifth lumbar, level onto the disc, reduce that nerve pressure, and these people get along very nice.